Okay, so for part one of homework 3-2. Uh, question one here, they ask the collision between an SUV and a small hybrid. Which one exerts the larger force, the hybrid or the SUV? Um, or they actually say the SUV exerts a larger force than the hybrid. And they just ask us, is that true or false? This is one you have to be careful on. That is a false statement, right? We know going back to Newton's third law that for every force there is an equal and opposite reaction. So as the large car hits the smaller car, the force between those two in the collision is the same. Now what we often perceive as a higher force is the fact that the smaller car has less mass and therefore it will accelerate more, it will change, change velocity more. But they both have the exact same force. Um, so again, watch out for this first one. I know that's one that a lot of times students fall into the trap of saying true. But just because it's a larger object does not mean the force is higher. Uh, forces are always, always equal and opposite. Another good concept question with question two here. So you're in a train on a horizontal track. All of a sudden you notice that the luggage starts to slide directly towards the front of the train. right? So maybe you have the luggage in the rack up above or below you or wherever. But all of a sudden the luggage starts to slide forward. Well this is actually something that probably a lot of us have experienced if maybe we've ridden on a plane or a train or something like that before. right? From this observation though what that tells us is the train is actually slowing down. So the reason this is happening, right, is as the train and the luggage are moving together at the same velocity, then their relative velocity, they're not moving with respect to each other. So their relative velocity would be zero. As the train starts to slow down, the luggage, the luggage natural tendency is to keep moving as fast as it originally was. So as the train slows down, that luggage just keeps going forward which is why it slides forward. So it's all about its, its inertia. It tends to continue to move forward, whereas the train is slowing down from underneath it. Again, hopefully this is a physical context we're comfortable with, but it's still a very good concept to think about. Question three is another rather difficult one here. So according to Newton's third law, we know that every force there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? So how are the horse and the carriage able to move forward? Well, option A doesn't make any sense, right? The horse is stronger. We just said Newton's third law says all forces are equal and opposite, so the strength of the individual horse does not particularly make a difference. So that is not a, not a right answer. So then we have the choice of B, C, or D, which would be both B and C. So B says the total force exerted on the carriage is the sum of forces exerted by the horse and the ground surface in the horizontal direction. So if I look at my carriage, right, the total force exerted, the net force exerted on the carriage well, I've got the horse pulling one way, and I do have maybe friction or any type of ground force exerted on it going in the other direction. So yeah, the total force of the uh, exerted on the carriage here actually would be the result of the horse and the friction or what have we uh, against the direction of the carriage. So that's actually true. So then option C, the net force of the horse is the sum of the ground static friction force on its hooves and the force exerted by the carriage. So now if I'm looking at my horse, and I can't draw a horse, so it's a stick figure horse, right? And he has no head, or here we go, he has a head. Anyway, so as I'm looking at my horse, the forces that act on the horse, say that three times fast. Anyway, the horses that act on it, the, the forces that act on it, would be the carriage pulling backwards, right? The force, the force that's equal and opposite between the horse and the carriage. Uh, I should probably just restart this problem, but I'm going to keep going. And then the static frictional force between the hooves would be what's allowing the horse to propel itself forward. So if there wasn't any friction, the horse would be slipping on the ground. And so we need that static frictional force that allows the horse to propel itself forward. So that's also true for all of those slip-ups I had as I was describing this. The net force of the horse is in fact the sum of the static friction and the carriage acting on the horse as well. So actually, option D is my best option. Both B and C are true. Both of those contribute to the net force, and therefore, again, option D is, is my best answer. This question, question four here, is a rather tricky one that's a good one to make sure you're comfortable with. Um, so I've got an elevator. It's moving downward. It's moving downward, so its velocity is downward, but they tell me it's slowing down. And that's actually a key concept going back to the first couple chapters, right? If I know something is moving in one direction but slowing down, 
the significance there is that tells me the acceleration needs to be going the other direction. If I've got something moving one way but slowing down, it only does that because it's accelerating in the opposite direction. So the reason that's so important, if I know the acceleration is upward, then that tells me the net force has to be going upward as well. right? The only way I have an acceleration going upward is if the net force is going upward. Well, because of that, when I think about the forces that act on this elevator, Right, if I think about all the forces, if I think about the free body diagram for this elevator, the only forces acting on the elevator are the force of gravity pulling downward and the tension in the cable holding it upward. Right, those are the only two forces that are acting on the elevator. If I know that the net force is going upward, what does that tell us about the tension and the force of gravity? It tells me they're not equal because if they were equal, the net force would be zero. It wouldn't be going upward. Right? The fact that the net force is going upward tells me the tension has to be bigger than the force due to gravity. Right? The only way this system can be accelerating upward is if the tension is greater than the force due to gravity. So here I know that the tension, again, the tension of the cable must be greater than the weight due to the uh, gravity of the elevator. Okay, so making sure we're comfortable with this one. Again, it's a very tricky one to get started on, but hopefully this makes sense because it's, it's definitely something we want to be comfortable with moving forward. Okay, so question five, six, and really even seven are mostly review questions here. These are mostly just going back to kinematic stuff. I'll still work through them, but hopefully we're getting more comfortable with this. So a child trying, trying to throw a ball over the fence. child throws the ball at an angle of 40 degrees and a velocity of 8 meters per second. right? And it tells us that that ball just barely clears the fence, although it does actually say in the diagram, or in the, in the obvious paragraph up there, that the ball clears the fence as it's going upward, right? And so we'll bring that into play in just a minute. But anyway, it asked me how far away is the child from the fence. So I'm looking for my delta x. How far was the distance between the child and the fence? So if I'm looking for delta x, right, hopefully most of us are comfortable enough now to know the only equation I'm really thinking is my constant horizontal velocity equals my horizontal distance over time. So if I want to find out how far away I am, I need to know what's my horizontal velocity and how long has this taken. Well, finding the horizontal velocity isn't bad, right? If I know the angle of the throw is 40 and I know the velocity is 8 meters per second, I can very easily find my two components of that throw. So again, V sub x would be the cosine component, so 8 times cosine of 40, and V sub y would be the sine component. Obviously, for starters here, I'm just going to find my horizontal velocity. I'm just going to find my V sub x. So when I do that, it's about 6.13 if I round it off to a couple places here. And then when I find my vertical, just so I have it in case I need it, I'm sure I probably won't need this, but just in case I do, 5.14 meters per second. Anyway, so I've got my horizontal velocity. I've got that component of the velocity. The problem is I don't know the time yet, right? So I, I run into a little bit of a pick up here because I don't have the time and so I can't find my delta x. So at this point you have two options you can either find the time or just make an educated guess and hope it's right. Hopefully we don't choose option B, right? We just want to find the time. So if I want to find the time and I get stuck horizontally, that's when I go to my vertical measurements. Well think about the information we know vertically. I know the initial vertical velocity, the initial vertical component right when it leaves the ground, or right when I should say it leaves her hand, is a positive 5.14. We always know the acceleration is 9.80 meters per second squared. In this case I'm going to define that as a negative since I've defined going upward as a positive 5.14 meters per second. So I've got those two pieces of information. What else do I know? Well they give me the heights, right? And so I know the change in height from where it left her hand to where it just barely clears the fence. I know my change in height, my delta y, would be 1.0 meters, or if you prefer, 1.01, to say that it just barely clears that fence. But I'm just going to use 1.0 meters. So I've got my initial vertical velocity, I've got my acceleration, and I've got my height, and I'm looking for the time. Right. So there's a couple different ways we could do this. We could set up delta x equals, or I should say delta y equals, vy sub 0 t plus 1 half at squared. We can definitely set that one up. The problem is you end up with a quadratic formula, which I know sometimes we don't like the quadratic formula. There's nothing to it other than just being comfortable enough 
to solve that. All right, so again, just setting this up, I get something that looks more or less like this. If I'm doing the quadratic equation, I would need to subtract the one over and then use my a, b, and c to factor. The other option I actually have though is, and this is gonna be the method I take, I'm actually just gonna use these measurements to find my final velocity first. And then once I have the final velocity, I can use VOTAP. So I'll set this up first to find my final vertical velocity. And again, there's no difference in doing this or doing the quadratic. I just choose to do this because I don't particularly like working the quadratic by hand, and I don't waste time using it on a calculator either. So anyway, solving for this, solving for that final vertical velocity, when I get that, I'm going to go ahead and just solve that out for you, not to waste your time. So I get about 2.61 meters per second, and then if I use VOTAP, I can figure out how long it's going to take me to reach that 2.61 meters per second. Okay, so my final velocity is 2.61, my initial velocity is 5.14, and then my acceleration is 9.8t. So solving for t, just subtracting the 5.14 and then dividing by negative 9.8, I get the time to be about 0 0.258 or about 0 0.26 seconds. Again, if you did the quadratic formula, one of your answers should have been 0 0.26 seconds. The other answer would have been a much larger time. But the reason that I know I use the 0 0.26 is because it passes it on the way up. And so I want the first time, I don't want the later time, because it would pass it again on the way back down, but that would take a longer portion of time, right? So I want that first time that I found using the quadratic, or if you chose to work at the method that I did, this is that first time that that happened. Um, in any case, either way, you should get that time, and once we have the time, it's really not too bad, right? So now that I've got the time, I know my horizontal velocity, again, going back was about 6.13. My delta x is what I'm looking for, and I know the time is 0 0.26. So solving for delta x, I just multiply both sides by 0 0.26, and then that's where I get my answer, the final answer here being 1.6 meters. That's the closest answer to the one that I end up getting. Um, so anyway, hopefully this question wasn't too bad. It is a lot of review. It is maybe a slightly more challenging kinematics question, but again, we've got to be getting very good at this stuff because we will see this crop up again and again throughout the year. Question six then is very similar to the question five that we just worked. Um, if you do want to just check your answer, 18.5 meters should have been the correct answer. So this will probably be the last question I work in this first part. Um, if you got that part right, then feel free to jump ahead to part two of this video. But anyway, if I want to find again how far it travels, I'm looking for the delta x, how far did it go? And that tells me just like in question five, I'm looking for v of x equals delta x over t. Right. So using this then, breaking it up, the first thing I'm going to do is find my two components. Hopefully we're getting very quick at finding those components because at this point, right, it's just the same thing over and over again. So 9.95 meters per second is what I get for my horizontal component. 9.12 is what I get for my vertical component. So then if I, if I want to find my horizontal distance, once again I know the horizontal velocity, but I don't know the time, so I have to do some vertical measurements to find the time. So vertically, I know my initial velocity is 9.12. I know my acceleration is negative 9.8. I'm looking for the time. So then I have a choice here of, I could say my final velocity at the highest point would be zero. The only thing I have to keep in mind if I do that is when I find my time, that's really only half of the time of the flight, right? So there's nothing wrong with doing this, but I just have to realize that that's only half of the time. So then if I set up VOTAP, Right, if I set up my velocity as a function of time, I know that the velocity at the highest point is zero, the initial velocity is 9.12, the acceleration is negative 9.8, and the time is what I'm solving for. So again, solving for that time, I get about 0 0.93, but I do have to realize that that is only half of the time. That is only the amount of time it takes to reach the highest point. That does not tell me the time that it takes to come back down. So I simply double that number, right? So my total time would be about uh, 1.86 based on where I've rounded my answer off at. So about 1.86 seconds. And then once I have the total time, hopefully easy enough, I've got my velocity of 9.95 meters per second. I'm looking for delta x, and I have my time of 1.86. So then solving for delta x, that's where I got my 18.5 meters from. Anyway, hopefully not too bad, right? Just review stuff.